Welcome in Fox Sports Radio Studios brought to you by Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. Visit geico.com for a free rate quote as well. Duralast batteries proven tough, designed to stand up to even the most extreme weather conditions. With patented technology to deliver the most power during startup, get in the zone, auto zone. I am Clay Travis. We are always in the zone here on Outkick the Coverage on Fox Sports Radio. You know who's not in the zone? The NBA playoffs. This is, uh, at this point, a total disaster. I would like to uh, humbly apologize to everyone for arguing yesterday as well as yesterday afternoon on Twitter that I anticipated the Celtics being able to give the Cavs a game in game one. I thought having played aggressively as many games as the Celtics have, the fact that they are coming off of a seven-game win uh, win in that series, the fact that they had played so many games that matter in the NBA playoffs, they went 4-2 to over the Bulls, then they win 4-3 to over the Wizards. I thought, I really did, that we were in exactly the perfect position for the Celtics to come out and steal game one because the Cavs had been on the sideline, totally resting. Cavs were 8-0. They were rolling into a tough situation in Boston Garden. I really thought this game would be close. I didn't necessarily think the Celtics would win, but I thought of all the games in the series, this was their best chance to win. I thought they would cover. I thought this game would be close, and I was completely wrong. From about eight minutes into this game on, it was not a contest. There was zero interest in watching this. This now makes, amazingly, This now makes the Cavs and the Celtics, sorry, the Cavs and the Warriors 19-0 so far. Why would you watch the NBA playoffs? Even the NHL game was a blowout last night. The Senators getting and taking down the Penguins with no contest either. But now the NBA, the Cavs and the Warriors are 19-0. I think there's a very good shot that both these teams are going to be 12-0 when they enter into the NBA Finals, and amazingly, if my counting is correct, if both these games only go four, again, if only four games take place in the Eastern and the Western Conference Finals, we're talking about a nine-day gap between when the Eastern and the Western Conference Finals end after double 4-0 situations there, sweeps. You have to wait nine days for the Warriors and the Cavs to start their series. Might be eight days but I believe it's nine days. That's unbelievable that we could have a situation where both teams are 12-0. and And even, by the way, if if the Celtics win a game or if the Spurs win a game, does it really matter? Is there any actual belief that either the Celtics or the Spurs can win these series? Of course not. So what's the point? I've said this before, but I think it definitely bears analysis and rigorous examination if I'm Adam Silver in the offseason. There are six sports yearly that Americans care about. Now, there's more sports that Americans care about. Look, we care about soccer during the World Cup. Next summer, everybody's going to care about the World Cup. We care about the Olympics and all the Olympic-related devices every two years during the summer and winter Olympics. But the six sports that Americans care about, the NFL, college football, the NBA, college basketball, Major League Baseball, and I'm being lenient here, hockey. Of those six sports, five of them enter the postseason with the belief that any team that has advanced to that postseason can win. What's more, all of those sports over the course of the season, you have a hope that your team might win a championship. Now it dies, but they at least give you that shot great examples going on right now in the NHL. Nashville Predators are hosting the Anaheim Ducks tonight. And if the Predators win that game, they'll be up 3-1. They were the eight seed, guys. The literal worst seed of the Western Conference in the NHL. Nobody in Nashville expected that the team would make a Stanley Cup run. It's possible right now that they're the overall favorite to win, and I think they would be right now, from odds makers, that they would be the overall favorite right now to win the Stanley Cup. Now, they may not do it, but they've come out of the worst seed in the NHL to make a run towards potentially winning the Stanley Cup. A few years ago, the LA Kings did it. Nobody in the eighth seed of the NBA playoffs remotely sniffed moving on to the second round. Hell, they didn't even win a single game. The eighth seed in this playoffs got shut out 4-0. 
in both the East and the West. The NFL, we've seen so many different teams come out of the wild card and find a way to win a championship. Major League Baseball, wild card teams have won the World Series. The college football playoff, Ohio State was the four seed starting Cardell Jones, the third the th- backup third string quarterback. Ohio State very lucky to make the playoff. They came out of nowhere after an early season loss to Virginia Tech and they win the championship. All of these other sports, we know obviously in college basketball, the NCAA tournament, so many upsets, so many teams that you didn't anticipate being in the mix. George Mason makes a run to the Final Four. Just think about how often we've seen a team that nobody anticipated winning a title, win a title in the NCAA tournament. All five of the six major sports other than the NBA Anything can happen. All bets are off once the postseason begins. I honestly don't know how, if you're an NBA fan, you sit around and watch the regular season right now. Because you're hoping that your team is going to find a way to luck into winning a series. If you're a Jazz fan, yeah, you won a series, and then you got totally run by the Warriors, and you saw that the gap between your team winning a championship and the Warriors is really, really substantial. Why is this Warrior team suddenly going to get worse? This is something that I think the NBA is going to have to deal with effectively until LeBron starts to decline. LeBron ain't declining right now. But if LeBron did decline, who's going to even step remotely close to the Warriors? And this is part of a larger issue I think the NBA is having to deal with, which is the regular season doesn't matter. The Cavs told us that when they decided, you know what, we don't even care about winning the number one overall seed. It's one thing to rest players. It's another thing to say, basically, we don't even care about home court. You know how long it took the Cavs to erase an 82-game home court advantage? About 12 minutes. By the end of the first quarter, you looked at this game and you said, man, I don't see any way the Celtics are going to win this game. 12 minutes in, the Cavs had reduced an 82-game season to nothing. And I ask this question, I mean legitimately. If I am LeBron James or I'm advising LeBron James, Why would LeBron not sit out every game until Christmas? That's the next step that I think a superstar like LeBron could take in the NBA. He has not lost a game in the postseason since, what was it, game four of the NBA Western Conference Finals. Ty Lue and LeBron James, and LeBron James, make no mistake about it, is a player coach of the Cleveland Cavaliers. Ty Lue and LeBron James have now won... 12 straight playoff games, if you go back to last year. Three straight in the NBA Finals to win that game, that series in seven against the Warriors. Nine straight this year. Probably going to win three more. Maybe they lose one to the Celtics, whatever. I think you can clearly tell it doesn't matter because the Celtics have no chance to win the seven-game series. Probably going to run in at 12-0. and Why would LeBron, now that they've established this year, that the regular season 100% doesn't matter? Remember, the Cavs finished with the same record as the Raptors. They went out and dominated them in four games. The Cavs finished with a worse record than the Boston Celtics. They're probably going to dominate them in four games. If LeBron James wants to stay off his feet, doesn't want to play more regular season games, decides that it's better off for his long-term future as he advances on 32, 33, 34, not to play in game NBA games in October, November, and not to come back until what really is, for a lot of people, the tip-off to the NBA season, that Christmas Day spectacular. If he decides not to come back to Christmas Day, would the Cavs still have any issue winning the NBA's Eastern Conference? I don't think they would. They go 500, let's say, without LeBron James. He comes back for the final 50 games of the year. They go 40-10 and or 38-14, and whatever they go with LeBron James for the remainder of that season, and then they go to the NBA Finals. I think the NBA has got such serious issues right now. Basketball in the long range is great. It's going to be the number two sport in the world behind soccer. It's a great game to play for people all over the world. It isn't very expensive, easy to put up basketball goals. The NBA has become a global brand. All of those things matter. But what ultimately matters that the NFL got right decades and decades ago was – you're only as strong as your weakest link. 
the NBA understood that on any given Sunday, you had to have the ability or the belief that your team could win. That's ultimately what makes a good sport. Believing that your team can win for as long as possible is what keeps you engaged in a season. How many people in the NBA right now really believe that a team other than the Cavs or the Warriors can win a title? If you're one of the 28 other teams, why does your season matter? There's no hope whatsoever that you are going to be competitive. And I think the NBA has a serious issue as long as this super team works with the Warriors and as long as LeBron is in the East. The idea that I floated to fix this, and I mean, honestly, if I were Adam Silver, I'd be looking at everything, was the idea of having like MLS. MLS is a fascinating setup for soccer. Not yet one of the major American sports in terms of people caring about it a ton. I know people care about it in different markets. For instance, Seattle is all in on the MLS. And there's now expansion going on. I think over the next decade, the MLS is going to grow. But what's fascinating about the way the MLS is set up is I believe they have three teams that are outside of the salary cap. So you can go sign superstars if you can afford to sign them because it's better for the league to have as many superstars on as many different teams as possible. But I think you're limited to three superstars. But that allows you to go overseas and grab a David Beckham at the tail end of his career. Uh, To go overseas and grab whoever you could, right? Uh, So that the Seattle team, I believe, could go sign Clint Dempsey and bring him in here to play. All that matters. And... It is totally absurd to me that right now you have all these guys making the decision. Kevin Durant can make any decision that he wants, but when he decided to go to the Golden State Warriors, effectively that ended the Western Conference race. So what would happen if you gave an unlimited salary cap exemption to all 30 NBA teams to pay whatever they wanted for market value for the top players? LeBron James is worth $100 million a year or whatever it is. And then Kevin Durant would be worth 85 or $90 million. You wouldn't have super teams. You'd have talent distributed throughout the league. Is this awful for the league or am I being unfair? I'll take your calls. 877-996-6369 is the collapse of the NBA regular season, which now leads to only two teams that can win championships. Absolutely awful. I am Clay Travis. You are listening to Outkick the Coverage on Fox Sports Radio. Your call. Also, we're going to talk about the LeVar Ball and Christine Leahy blow up yesterday on the herd. This is Outkick the Coverage on Fox Sports Radio. Live from the Geico Fox Sports Radio studios, everybody's got a to-do list. Drop off the dry cleaning, pick up some milk. Here's an idea. Let's add, save hundreds of dollars on car insurance. And the good thing is, you don't have to drop off or pick up anything. All you have to do is go to geico.com, and in 15 minutes, you could be saving 15% or more on car insurance. Extra money in your pocket. It just may be the most rewarding to-do you do today. Several people on Twitter reacting to the opening show of the segment. Tyler, Brandon, uh, Craig. Both one seeds didn't sweep first-round opponents this season. Boston dropped two games versus Chicago. LOL. Look, here's the deal. The number one seed in the Eastern Conference is the Cavs. I don't care what the actual seeding says. The Cavs decided they didn't care about the regular season. If you believe that Boston is the one seed here, then explain to me why they're a, whatever it is, 1-25 to favorite the Cavs are to finish this series now. Why the Boston Celtics opened as four-and-a-half point home underdogs in game one. The Cavs are the one seed, even though they're not technically the one seed. So when I say that the one seed, the best team in the East and the best team in the West are 19-0 and in the playoffs, that's true. The Celtics are not the one seed. I think that's well established for anybody with a functional brain. So don't be a pussy willow about things like that. Don't be the person who sits around like focused on a little detail when the Celtics suck compared to the Cavs. When the Cavs decided to rest the final week of the season, the last regular season game the Cavs had against the Celtics, they also went into Boston and dominated the Celtics. Back when it looked like before the Cavs gave up on the season, they were going to lose the regular season to the Celtics, they rolled into Boston Garden and just destroyed them. I don't know what the solution is. 
I will tell you this right now. I wish we could just scrap. I tweeted this last night. I wish we could just scrap the Eastern and the Western Conference remainder of these series and say, let's go ahead and start the NBA Finals right now. Is there anybody out there who is a sports fan that would object to Adam Silver coming in and just issuing a decree that it's clear based on what we've seen in the first 19 games of the playoffs, during which time the Warriors and the Cavs are 19-0, that via official decree, I am now moving us to the NBA Finals and we're going to play a best of 11 instead of a best of 7. Instead of the first to four, we're going to go with the first to six, and we're going to go ahead and start this series on Sunday. Is there anybody out there that would be like, no, 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 I don't want to see that? Maybe some loser Celtic fans who are like drunk already this morning on the idea that the Celtics are going to bounce back and they're going to win the series. Some of you delirious, delusional Spurs fans out there like, no, the Warriors aren't that much better than us. And by the way, those people tweet me all the time. Man, if we had still had Kawhi Leonard, we'd be we we would have swept the Warriors. No, you wouldn't have. You're gonna lose this series, even if Kawhi Leonard hadn't come down and hurt his ankle. There's no point in playing the rest of the Eastern and the Western Conference Finals. And I said there's gonna be like a nine day gap because both I think the Warriors and the Cavs are gonna run through each of their respective conferences so quickly that for the first time ever we're gonna have two teams meeting that I believe are gonna be 12 and 0 against 12 and 0. The only solution I can find for the NBA is a radical redesign of the salary cap. Right now the salary cap in the NBA, and I've talked about this on the show, I'm a capitalist. Everybody who listens to this show knows that it's very foundational level, I believe that you should be able to sell your labor for as much money as the market will bear. Right now LeBron James is not able to do that. LeBron James makes roughly 30 million dollars a year. If he went on the open market right now as a legitimate free agent and there were no restrictions about his overall value, he would get around $100 million at least. Maybe substantially more than $100 million. That would encourage LeBron James to go to a team and make the most money. The same thing would happen for Kevin Durant, who's probably the second best player in the NBA right now. Everybody would filter all the way down through. That's my solution. You give 30 teams one salary cap exemption to pay whatever a guy's worth on the open market. Then you avoid superstars clustering together in the same way. You might still have guys who are good clustering together, but you would avoid having a situation like the Warriors where four of the best 10 players are on the team. And that way you would have 30 NBA teams and you'd be more likely to have even competition. And so when the playoffs started, you'd be able to actually watch and think there's some suspense going on. As is, there's absolutely none. Anybody disagree with me, let's go around the horn. Jason Martin, my producer in Nashville. We got Danny G and Justin in L.A. We'll start with uh, Jason Martin. Is there any reason to watch the rest of the Eastern and Western Conference Finals other than gambling, Jason Martin? I mean, more so the East than the West. I think we know where we're headed here. Um, One point that I know that, that you didn't mention in that first segment was that the the numbers are up. I mean, the 8% raise right now in ratings on ESPN. I think the number on TNT is a little bit higher than that. So they're doing well. A lot of people are watching these games even without the drama. I think that I you know, I was thinking I didn't think the Celtics had a chance last night going in. I thought I did think they might get one at home. I still think they might get one at home. But we are going to Cavs and Warriors. I don't think that you can just cancel the playoffs and get to that now. I mean, that's Go to that's an 11 game series, yeah, you cancel can't, you the can't rest do of that. It. I mean, you can't just have that. Adam that's Silver come out and teams. say this sucks. Nobody wants to watch it. You're saying the ratings are up. What, they are what up. Doesn't, yeah, but that, that's a, a bit of a smoke and mirrors there because you're getting a lot less content, right? When they say ratings are up, they mean ratings are up relative to the games that were played. The amount of inventory that they're getting, the amount of people watching the NBA playoffs is down. Does that make sense? That's what nobody takes the next step and points out. Because while the numbers may be up for four games of the Warriors, they're down dramatically over, for instance, last year's Western Conference Finals where they got seven games, right? The numbers themselves on an aggregate may be up for an individual game, but they're playing a lot less of them, so the the series are worth less for each individual television partner, right? Like last year, TNT caught lightning in a bottle with a seven-game series that was exhilarating 
between the Thunder and the Warriors. And they got the benefit of a seven-game series. And the, the, as, the, as the season goes on, as the, as the series goes on, the numbers go up substantially. And most people aren't, don't start to watch until the Eastern and the Western Conference Finals. They are going to collapse precipitously if you look at it as a seven-game series versus a four-game series. They're going to lose a lot of money relative to what they had last year in, for instance, the Western Conference Finals. So I, I don't buy into, look, I think the NBA Finals may do a great number. I have a sneaking suspicion that the Warriors are going to come out and win in five and be one of the best, if not the best, team in the history of the NBA playoffs. So I, I think the NBA's got a real issue here. Danny G and Justin, any solution at all? Well, I, I don't know about solution, but one thing to keep in mind, Clay, is that you're a LeBron James twisted ankle or maybe, uh, say, a Steph Curry broken foot away from, you know, a, a whole series changing on the Are the you drop really of for the Warriors? I think the Warriors could have any one of their top four break an ankle well, and they it, would still sweep the Spurs. Well, it still would change. Look at what happened with Rondo. I mean, remember what you thought about that series before That's he got true, injured? But, but those teams are not very good. Like, yes, LeBron could get hurt, but LeBron could have gotten hurt also at any point over the last 15 years. LeBron is a machine. The dude just isn't human. He doesn't get hurt. I, I mean, hear, I, I, I don't yeah, know what the reason I, is. I agree with you on that, but the point is the games still need to be played because sports is the ultimate reality TV show. What if the air conditioning breaks? Yeah, that's the, maybe that maybe that's the only solution. In, in, in Boston Garden, the only way they can advance is they need to just break the air conditioning because otherwise LeBron and co. are going to roll back in whenever they play this next game. They're going to dominate, and they're going to be up 2-0 going back home to Cleveland, and they're going to close out the Celtics in 4-0. And if they don't close them out in a sweep, they're going to lose one game and then win the next three. I just – I don't – there's been no indication whatsoever. For, ever since the first series where the Cavs didn't play that well – against the Pacers. I mean, let's be honest. The Pacers played the Celtics. I mean, the Pacers played the Cavs better so far than either the Raptors or the Celtics have. I know it's early in this series, but at least the Pacers were competitive in that first four-game series. All right, I'm going to play you some audio here from the herd yesterday. This is Christine Leahy and LeVar Ball. LeVar Ball does offer some hope for the NBA because his son Lonzo could end up with the Lakers. If you haven't heard this audio I think you're going to have a lot to react to here. We're going to play that. But first, let's find out what's trending now. Welcome back. Fox Sports Radio Studios brought to you by GEICO. It's easy to save 15% or more on car insurance with GEICO. Go to GEICO.com or call 800-947-AUTO. The only hard part, figuring out which way is easier. As well as with TrueCar, you can find out what other people in your area Paid for the same car you're looking for and, on average, save over three grand off MSRP. Whether you're looking for a new or used car, visit TrueCar to enjoy a more confident car buying experience. Yesterday on The Herd, LeVar Ball came in to make his first media appearance since the Lakers gained the number two overall spot in the uh, NBA draft lottery. The Lakers now, LeVar Ball believes, going to draft his son Lonzo. That will keep him in L.A. He believes LeVar does Magic Johnson 2.0. LeVar has made a lot of news. He's been on this show. He's been on pretty much every show on ESPN and Fox across the board. And yesterday he was on the on the Colin Cowherd show inside the herd in studio when things got a little bit testy between LeVar Ball and Christine Leahy. Here is that audio. Like I said, there's different amounts. How many? Stay in your lane. Anyways, I'm just curious. I don't even worry about her over there. Like, Every time not? she scares I think that's me to kind death. Of disrespectful. She says she scares Lonzo. Lonzo scared of me. She scares me. That's I'm why I don't look that way. I said that I wouldn't wear something that. It as says a woman. big baller. It's the same thing. Yeah. With I, all due respect, I, you're a great reporter, just not reporting on me. Uh, well, I, I think if, in order to have a successful company, you're going to have to have women who like your brand. Uh, <laughs> yeah, if you have a women's company. But anyways. Oh, so we're you're not about, marketing. We're talking about big baller brand. Now that Lonzo's headed to Los Angeles, what they should have did is gave me a billion dollars and let me be on my way. That, that's unrealistic. They're not yeah, unrealistic to you. No, it's now it's, you know what? If they want to come talk to me now, it just went up to three billion. Triple B's. They wouldn't want to work with you anyway because you don't respect women. So I never disrespect women, but I tell you what, you if, you act, if you act like that, guess what? Something's coming to you. Oh, and it's okay. Do you do you think? Are you wait? Are you threatening me? Oh, see how she tried to turn the words. I would never threaten you. You said something's coming to me. I don't know what it is. I'm not a psychic. That was riveting radio. 
credit to the social media team at Fox Sports Radio for getting that out so quickly. My thoughts on this, and I want to open up the phone lines and let you guys react to what you just heard, too, because I think it's a big story. LeVar Ball, up to this interview with Colin Cowherd, had been a lovable, cartoonish buffoon. Nothing that he had said, while you might dis- debate it and dispute it, had been really that that strange, right? There hadn't been a dark side to anything that LeVar Ball had said. Yes, you could come on and say, I don't know that LeVar Ball is the best for what Lonzo's career needs in the future. I'm not sure that speaking out as aggressively and saying that you could beat Michael Jordan one-on-one or that Lonzo was going to be the next Magic Johnson or selling your shoe for $495 and getting into it with all the major sneaker brands in the country. All of those things, for better or worse, you could say, okay, it's part of branding. It's part of reaching the community and making them aware of your sons. This took a dark turn. I think to the credit of the Colin Cowherd and his show and Christine Leahy, that was legitimately authentic radio. One of the reasons that I like radio is it cuts through in in authenticity. Much of television is fake. And I say that having done a lot of television. It's a performance. You are working out a play. You know what somebody's going to say. It's very scripted. You know that the order that which you're going to say it. I come into this show with probably 40 words written down on a piece of paper in front of me. And that's the rough outline for what I think I'm going to talk about today. But at any moment, we can pivot and go in a different direction. That's what radio is. And I thought it was fantastic radio yesterday. In particular, I thought, and I'm not, you know, guys, you guys know that I live by the don't be a pussy willow mantra, right? Don't blame other people. Be better. That's my number one goal here. I thought Christine Leahy was perfectly within her rights here, and LeVar Ball showed himself to be a buffoon, and I thought the way that he treated her was sexist. And I'm not a guy who plays that card. You guys know that I very rarely will say that I think somebody's being treated differently based on race or sex or anything else. I think LeVar Ball there, the way he was interacting with Christine Leahy, was 100% sexism. I don't believe that he would have talked to me that way. I don't believe that he would have talked to Jason Whitlock. I thought the joke about Jason Whitlock only being an expert on snacks was perfect. Now, I have done the the Cowherd show quite a few times in L.A. Colin's a friend of mine. Christine is a friend of mine. Jason Whitlock is a friend of mine. I know all three of those people well. So you can say, Clay, you're biased because these are people that you're friends with. But when I watched that situation... I have sat on that couch where LeVar Ball is sitting on that couch. I have interacted with Christine Leahy on multiple occasions, many different times, during the course of that show. You go on Colin's show to be a guest with Colin, but also Christine is on that show, and when she interjects, you respond and interact with her. That's how a show works. I thought it was incredibly disrespectful of LeVar Ball to not be willing to address Christine Leahy and look at her, I thought it was incredibly disrespectful to tell her to stay in her lane. I'm fine with disagreeing with women or disagreeing with men or disagreeing with people that you're different than. But what you can't do, in my opinion, is treat somebody differently solely based on something that they can't control. I.e., I'll come out here and tell you that I think Tack McKinley was an idiot for taking his dead grandma's picture up on the stage, right? I don't tiptoe up to my opinions. I thought he looked like an idiot. I'm not saying that because Tack McKinley is a black guy. I also went after Garrett Bowles, who I thought looked like an idiot, when he took his kid on the stage at the draft and said that he was going to remember it forever, and the kid is four months old. I think that the way LeVar Ball talked to Christine Leahy was about her being a woman. It wasn't about her opinion at all. People out there say, oh, the reason why he was mad at Christine was because she talked about his parenting and his relationship with Lonzo, and you don't do that. Really? The only reason why LeVar Ball is famous at all is because he's a dad. The man hasn't done anything to be in the news other than having produced Lonzo and a couple of other sons. His relationship with Lonzo is integral to his existing in the public arena. 
this is an interesting dichotomy. I'm not necessarily a fan of LeBron James in terms of the way that he's carried himself of late, complaining about the use of the word posse, getting all triggered when Charles Barkley criticized him for whining, the way that he reacted to LeVar Ball when LeVar Ball talked about how usually superstars didn't have great sons as basketball players. But LeBron James, remember what he said? He said, take my family out of your mouth, which is why it would be now ironic if LeVar Ball's upset about people commenting on his family. But LeVar brought LeBron James's family into the equation when LeBron hadn't necessarily done anything to put his kids into the limelight. Now, I think LeVar happened to be right. By and large, superstars don't produce superstars. There are ex- exceptions. But most of the time, guys who played in the NBA, you have a Seth Curry, sorry, a, uh, a Dell Curry, who was pretty good, and he produces Steph, who's incredible. You have Kobe Bryant's dad, who was pretty good, and he produces Kobe, who's incredible. By and large, Michael Jordan, the best player in the world, doesn't also have a son who also happens to be the best player in the world. Genetics matter, but being the best is really incredibly difficult. And so that genetic code that creates the best doesn't typically typically replicate. I mean, I don't even know. Maybe it's the Bonds family. Maybe it was Archie Manning. It's relatively rare that you are an elite athlete and you produce elite athletes. But I thought Christine Leahy was completely within her right to ask how many shoes he had sold. That's a question that every single person listening right now has had ever since we knew those shoes were selling for $495. And I thought everything that followed LeVar Ball was in the wrong. I thought he treated her differently and didn't take her opinion seriously because she was a girl. You can agree or disagree. You can react right now. 877-996-6369. This is Outkick the Coverage. Your call's next. Was LeVar Ball sexist on Fox Sports Radio? Live from the Geico Fox Sports Radio studios, what does it mean when Geico says just 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance? It means you probably should have gone to geico.com 15 minutes ago. We're talking about LeVar Ball's performance, and I think it's fair to say it's a performance. I think he's an actor. I think he's really good at being entertaining, but I think that the way he treated Christine Leahy yesterday was sexist. I think the very definition of sexism is treating somebody differently than you would somebody else who's a male in this situation. I don't think that LeVar Ball would have talked to me like that if I had been sitting in Colin Cowherd's studio. I don't think he would have talked to Jason Whitlock like that. I don't think that he would have talked to my producing core like that, probably. You may disagree. You may think that everything that he said to Christine Leahy was perfectly within bounds. I think that he can say whatever he wants, first of all, right? I'm a First Amendment absolutist. But then when you say stuff, you can get attacked for it. And that's my perspective in general. Let's go around the horn with the crew here. Do you guys agree with me that LeVar Ball was treating Christine Leahy in a sexist manner in that interview on The Herd? Jason Martin. Yeah, I agree with you. You know, I I don't want to try and put intentions into somebody's mind because I wasn't there. And, I you know, I'm not him. I don't know whether or not that's what he intended or if that's just how it came across. Uh, obviously, she's been critical of him in the past, so has Jason Whitlock. So, and he doesn't strike me as somebody that takes criticism particularly well. And well, I let me do say this, too. He, well, let, me, let, me, let me cut that. I think that's a good point, because I don't think he's used to criticism. Mm. For anybody out there who enters into the public eye that hasn't been in the public eye before, I think the amount of criticism that you get for any opinion right now is bracing. I've said this before. If your average person who's listening to this show right now had my Twitter feed for a day, they wouldn't be able to handle it. They'd be like so riled up about all the people who are tweeting things that they disagree with that that I'm saying all day long. I mean, there are literally hundreds of times people tell me I'm an idiot every day because they disagree with my opinion. That's fine, right? I I can take it, but I've built up that tolerance. Just like you don't suddenly go out and run a marathon, you can't step into the public arena and be able to take all these blows. I mean, look, Donald Trump can't handle it right now, and he's been in the media for years. It's a it's a savage world out there. And I think in particular when it's you being attacked directly. So I think the fact that suddenly LeVar Ball says, oh, you can't talk about my relationship with my kids in a negative fashion. Dude, the only reason you're famous at all is is because of your relationship with your kids. If that's off bounds, out of bounds, 
then I don't know what else you can say. Like, I agree with LeBron in this context. If you make your kids the reason that you're famous, then you can't complain when people analyze your relationship with your kids. It's like Chris Jenner can't complain if somebody analyzes her ability to be a mom based on the Kardashian show. Just like whatever that Keeping Up With The Duggar show was, when the people had like 14 kids and they had their own reality show, you can't then complain that people are analyzing your parenting skills. This reminds me is that, remember that John and eight, John and Kate plus eight show that was so popular? Kate Goslin, John Goslin, whatever they go, the guy's names were. They had eight kids, I think, or six kids all at once, whatever the hell it was. They had a litter of kids. And the entire show was about them being parents for eight kids. And they started to get upset. They're like, look, we're just a family. I don't know why we're being criticized as parents. I'm like, the entire purpose of your reality show in which you allow cameras to follow you around all day is what it would be like to be a parent with that many kids. Same thing with that MTV show. When MTV had their show about like 16 and pregnant or whatever it was, teenage girls who were pregnant, and then people criticized their parenting. It's like literally the reason you are famous is because you're a parent. You can't then complain because people aren't always just praising you as a parent. LeVar Ball's parenting skills are certainly there to be debated. That, I don't understand how that's remotely a point of contention for him. When you make your family the reason that you're famous, just like with the Kardashians, just like with the Duggars, just like with the Goslins, that's the reason you're famous, just like everybody else out there who does like Friday Night Tykes, all what was the show where they had the Honey Boo Boo, uh, the pageant parents and all those things. That's all fair game. If you don't yeah. want your parenting skills to be cr- to be uh, to be critiqued, then don't make your parenting the focal point of why you're famous. Here's here was here was where I was headed, which was, I think it was sexist more because I don't think Lavar Ball would have gotten into that arena, into that ring with Christine, if he saw her as an equal and thought he could lose, because he's not somebody that wants to go out there and lose a verbal battle. He did not take into consideration how smart she was. And once she realized she needled him, she wasn't going to let him out of the ring. She wasn't going to let him get a 10 count. She was going to put the pressure on him and see how he reacted. And what we saw was he reacted incredibly poorly. And to me, the sexism comes because I don't think he would have done that to you because he would have thought you were smart. And I don't think that he saw that in Christine, so he thought that he could take advantage of it, and he was sorely, sorely mistaken. And it played badly for him. Danny G and Justin, do you guys agree? Like, do you believe that he would have talked to me the same way that he talked to Christine? I, I think it's I think it's possible, Clay. I, I didn't I didn't hear the entire interview, so I don't I don't know. I could be wrong on this point, but I agree with you that you got to be open to you know people criticizing your parenting when that's what you are is just you know parent of. It's the only Ball. reason Levar Ball is famous is because he has famous kids. He hasn't done anything like to LeBron's credit. When LeBron said, leave my kids out of this story, LeBron's saying, look, I'm famous. You can talk about me, but don't talk about my kids. I haven't made them the story. Same thing about me. Like, I, I don't really care what you say about me. I think it's rough when I put out a picture of my kids and people take shots at my kids. I'm like, really? I got a nine, a six, and a two-year-old? Like, you really think they're in the arena in terms of being able to rip them? Mafia wouldn't even do that. We're going to open up the phone lines. I'll take your calls on this. 877-996-6369. Am I right or am I being a pussy willow? Was LeVar Ball out of line here on Fox Sports Radio? Welcome back. Fox Sports Radio Studios brought to you by GEICO. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. Visit GEICO.com for a free rate quote as well. Drive the new Duralast GT brake pads. Proven tough from the tracks to the streets and sold only at AutoZone. Get in the zone. AutoZone. Always in the zone here. If you're waking up across the country... I'm demanding that we have an 11-game series for the NBA Finals and that we go ahead and end the Eastern and Western Conference Finals. There's no uncertainty out there. The Cavs and the Warriors are now 19-0 so far in the playoffs. The two best teams not even able to be challenged inside of their own conferences. Let's go ahead and get to the NBA Finals instead of waiting till June 1st or whatever day it is and go ahead and start now and play a best of 11 as opposed to a best of 7. We are also talking about what happened yesterday on The Herd. Christine Christine Leahy and LeVar Ball got into it. Was it or was it not sexist of LeVar Ball, the way he talked to her, the way he said stay in her own lane? And I think in a larger scale, if you're saying, why does this matter? Does Jeannie Buss watch this and and have second thoughts about drafting Lonzo Ball? Jeannie Buss, a powerful woman, right? 
when LeVar Ball refuses to look Christine Leahy in the eyes and when he refuses to consider her perspective and when he refuses to acknowledge that if you're trying to build a brand that's based on apparel, women are buying all the shoes for pretty much every boy who wants those shoes between 12 and probably 20. If you're paying $500 for those shoes and you're a 12 to 20-year-old boy, your mom's probably involved. Moms make most apparel decisions. The vast majority of things that men wear oftentimes are bought by women. I got a whole closet full of stuff I didn't buy. My wife said, I think you'd look good in that. And I thought, she might sleep with me if I wear this. And so I got it. That's true. True for men everywhere. Some of us are fashion plates. Most of us defer to women in our lives to make sure we don't look like total idiots when we have to get dressed on our own. LeVar Ball saying that he doesn't care about women, the big baller brand's not for women. That's fine. You don't have to make women's clothing. But I definitely think you need to consider the way that you're going to come across, particularly now where we got a month or six weeks or whatever it is until the actual NBA draft, and everybody's looking for reasons not to pick you. That's what happens in the draft. Everybody picks apart every aspect of your game, and I think that LeVar Ball is a substantial negative for Lonzo Ball. I really do. Now, maybe Lonzo is eventually going to become independent. He's only 19 years old. But I think the way LeVar carried himself on the herd yesterday was a big red flag if I'm Jeannie Buss. If I'm sitting around in L.A. and I'm saying, who am I going to invest in in this number two pick? Do I want the LeVar Ball circus for the next several years? I'm not sure that I do. People say, why do you care about LeVar Ball? Well, he's made himself a story. And he's made himself a story based on his relationship with Lonzo. I don't think there's any doubt. 877-996-6369. I'm curious what your reaction is going to be. I want to pull up the poll results. I'm on Twitter at Clay Travis. Was the way that LeVar Ball treated Christine Leahy yesterday sexist? I think it was. 61% of you, as we come up on 1,000 votes, agree with me that LeVar Ball was sexist. Now, that means 40% of you nearly think that he was not. So if you disagree with me, you're welcome to come in and tell me why my opinion is wrong. Danny G, does anybody in the show here believe that he wasn't sexist? Danny G, are you also in the sexist camp? Uh, I think sexist is kind of a strong word to why use. Would you, how would happened. you defend him that he wasn't sexist? Uh, because I, I'll say he, he was rude, he was condescending, but I've seen him act like that on other shows. Uh, obviously, these two have a little bit of a history with each other, back and forth. I think that has a ton to do with what happened. And so I could see both sides of it because, Clay, I went to their website and looked. They do have women's apparel on the Triple B website. So well, now they're not certain. they're not marketing to women. But, look, I, I just think it's a bad look for him. But I think it kind of got blown overboard. When you don't engage in an argument, to me, that's a form of disrespect. I always tell my wife that. I'm not sure if it works, but you can file this away as a potential thing to, uh, to, to use the next time you get into an argument with your significant other. If I don't argue back with you, it's because I consider your argument to be worthless, right? Like when I hang up on people on this show, I'm like, that's not a good argument. We're on in 50 states. If you're going to step to me and try to bring an argument on the show, it has to be an argument that's worthy of actual contemplation. And a lot of times people call in, they make bad arguments. I'm like, and that's a bad argument. Hang up. Let's hang up. Right? I mean, that's what I do. People say, oh, you don't leave your callers on long enough. Well, a lot of times I don't leave the caller on long enough because the argument's bad or because I can make the counter argument better. I could make, if I wanted to defend LeVar Ball here, the challenge is I don't know how I could do it in a legitimate fashion. I could do it because I can make any argument. It's what lawyers do, right? You can defend anybody. I've defended murderers. I can certainly defend LeVar Ball going on the herd. I, I just felt like, in watching it, I watched it live when it happened. I just felt like he doesn't like her. And is that because she's a woman? I, I don't know. I'm not I'm not in his head. I can't answer I that for him. In but. order for him not to like her, I don't understand what she said that's so inappropriate. Well, see, I, and by I, the way, I would go on and just – and he should have called her out on it. Like if he disagrees with her based on the way she's treated him, he could have fired back and said, look, I'm not going to engage with you right now because I thought you were out of bounds in the way that you criticized my relationship with my sons. I think I've done a pretty good job raising them. You can criticize me as much as you want – but the moment that you start to criticize my family, that's to me a line that I'm not willing to cross. 
I appreciate the fact that that's your job, but I thought yeah. you went overboard. Like, I, if you I just get said that, that, but it would be like if we had a guest on your show here and Jason started going at the guest and they started getting into it. Because the one thing that I, I also noticed, how come Colin didn't really come to her defense? He stayed well, out of I it. Think, I think Colin did a good job there because if you come to his def- – if he had come aggressively to her defense, it's like It's like she needed – I, I hear that, and I read tons of comments – all over FoxSports.com yesterday and everything. but And I get that. I, I understand why people would jump to that right away. But I think you got to dig a little deeper than that. because if, if I thought the question that she asked that started all this was one that everybody wants to know, right? The number one question I think people had for LeVar Ball, other than are you so excited your son's going to go to the Lakers and all those things. And look, I think this is good for the NBA. I've been saying, I think Lonzo is good for the NBA there. But if I were Jeannie Buss... And I watched this video, and I watched this, and I guarantee you she will. Uh, and and I watched this interview. What I start to think: Is he going to respect me as the owner of the Lakers, or is he going to demean me in the press the same way that he demeaned Christine Leahy? And I think it's different than the way that he's demeaned other guys, right? Like to me, making fun of Jason Whitlock and saying I don't care about Jason Whitlock's opinion. All he know, all he deserves to have an opinion on is snacks, right? Like okay. That's something that would totally be said by dudes sitting around. Like, I have zero issue with it. I heard Whitlock say he had zero issue. I knew he would have zero issue with it. That's fair game, right? If you want to fire back and make fun of Jason Whitlock over his appearance because he's overweight, like, it's low-hanging fruit. But I'm not the guy out there who's going to say, like, I think fat shaming is awful, right? Like, you can make fun of people for anything as far as I'm concerned. That's like, to me, making fun of each other is kind of a sign of respect, and if you got a good sense of humor, you can handle it. Whitlock's, you know, you might not like Whitlock. People don't like me. But I think you got to say we both have fairly good senses of humor. If you read our mentions, you know, we get ripped a lot. And it doesn't really impact us, especially when people go after physical things. So I think that's fine, whatever. Um, but to me, not not accepting Christine Leahy as an equal there, I think I don't – you could be right. I think the only defense you could make for LeVar Ball is saying he would have treated a guy – the exact same in that situation. I, and I don't I think feel, you would have. Well, that's debatable, but I just feel like he kept trying to go back to Colin. Like, I, I want to talk to you. And so I feel like if a guest was going back and forth with J-Mart and they got into it, and he's like, look, look, I don't want to get into it with you. You're a good reporter, but don't report about me. And then he kept trying to uh, engage with you because that's why he was there. Then, you, you know, that's that's how I took it. That's how it came off to me. Yeah, you can make that defense. Again, I just think that at some point in time, I don't think he would have – he would not – like refusing to make eye contact with her, all those things. I thought it was very strange behavior. Uh, you guys don't have to agree with me. You can be wrong, as I always say. Uh, 877-996-6369. Who's best to go to, Jay Mart? I'll start with Byron in Texas. Byron down in Texas. What's up, Byron? How you doing? I'm excellent. Uh, I, I don't think it was sexual at all, uh, Clay. I, I'll be honest with you. I'm not a LeVar Ball fan by no means. Uh, uh, and I think Christine done a great job yesterday. I do agree that um, I believe he would have treated a, a guy like that. I really You do. do. I, I mean, I think that. that's the only way. You, and that's the ultimate. Look, people say, oh, Clay Travis, you're sexist, you're racist, you're homophobic, you're transphobic. I try to treat everybody the exact mm-hmm. same, right? Like, regard right. to me, if you see somebody and you're like, oh, that's a black guy, I'm going to talk to him differently than I'm a white guy. If you see a girl and you're like, oh, I'm going to talk to that girl differently mm-hmm. than I'm going to talk to a guy, that's the very definition of treating somebody differently based on their race or their sex. And I don't right. do that. Like, yeah, I try to treat everybody the same. Sometimes I treat everybody like a jerk. I think you can say LeVar Ball in his defense, that's the best defense you can provide is that he would have treated everybody the exact same. Well, he's a jerk. I mean, he's a jerk. And listen, I'm not a LeVar Ball fan, but i got to say something. And, and this is an uh, interesting thing that I've never heard anybody really talk about. You know, we, we say all these things about LeVar Ball. He's actually done a, a very good job with raising three boys. So I far. Three boys myself. Yep. So far, he's done a great job. Well-mannered young men, uh, very good athletes. But I, the thing that kind of worries, one makes me wonder is, Lonzo or uh, the other two haven't really spoken out if this is anything bad to them. Yep. Listen, the shoe situation, I believe Lonzo was a young man, a kid. He wanted his own shoe. He told his dad. I believe all those guys probably came up together with the big baller brand because they're all endorsing it to the hill. I know if I went and did some of those things for my three boys, they would shut me down quickly. In the How old are your three boys? Don't do it. 
I have a 24-year-old, a 22-year-old, and a 18-year-old. My 18-year-old is a singer. My 22-year-old works in the 22-year-old is a uh, surgical tech, and my 24-year-old works in the pipeline. And if I went to brag or do any of those number of things about those kids, they shut me down quick. At so what I age do you think they started to shut you down? They would shut me down. They would have shut me down at age fourteen. They don't yeah. really get into that. Dad, hey, cut it out. That's enough. And yep. I raised three good boys. I raised three good boys. So I, I got to commend him on three right now. Three well mannered boys who are good athletes. Uh, he's a little braggadocious, and and you know I think that's going to hurt Lonzo in the long run because the expectations are going to be set. The, the expectations are set too high and we're going into the NBA with his greatest players. That's, that's there, but. I'm very curious, how involved are those three young men? I yeah, really believe Lonzo is more involved in this than we believe. And his, Because let me tell you, I really believe Lonzo, if he really wanted to, he goes to his mother like other kids, other boys, to go to mom, and mom shuts dad down. So I'm <laughs> believing that Lonzo... I'm believing that Lonzo is more involved in this. He really, he's really pushing the shoe. The shoe isn't selling well. It's not a good product. Uh, but I don't believe what he did yesterday was sexist. I believe LeVar Ball was who LeVar Ball's been. I've heard him in other interviews where he's done this kind of stuff. I, I, I give Christine a lot of credit for sticking in there. But anybody that challenges a relationship uh, with your child, anybody's going to respond with that uh, the way he did. And that's simply because uh, you don't want to be challenged. You, you know your child. That's why I say Lonzo, I believe, is more involved in this than we all could ever know. I really believe that. Yeah, I appreciate the call. I appreciate the call, Byron, and good job with your three sons. I've got three sons, too. i got a nine, a six, and a two-year-old. They're really young. But that, that, that to me, is, I I do think, an interesting angle. Like, so far, he seems to have done a very good job raising his kids, but he has interjected their relationship into a larger scale. He's basically done what the Kardashians did. He's done what the Duggars did. He's done what the Gosselins did. They made their parenting an integral part of their overall public persona. Because the only reason LeVar Ball is famous is because of those three kids. It's not because of anything that he's done. And that, to me, is where everything that you say about his relationship with his kids is fair game. Because otherwise, what do you say? And I think it's fair for Christine to ask, what is Alonzo's real thoughts on the way that his dad has got him portrayed? I think his dad hurt his chances of winning in the Sweet 16. I think that Darren Fox, who beat Lonzo pretty bad head-to-head, scored 39 points on him. I think that Kentucky team played better because LeVar ran his mouth. You could think that's crazy. You could think I'm an idiot for that argument. But I think that Kentucky performed better because of all the smoke that LeVar Ball was blowing. Let's go to J.D. in Fort Myers. J.D., what's up? What a Richard... I mean, straight up. I mean, completely disrespected her. You know what I hope? I hope Jeannie Buss gets on the phone with Danny Ainge and says, hey, do me a favor, take the heat off me, grab him with the number one so I'm not I'm not look, look like a fool for not taking him, and uh, do a sign and trade with Isaiah Thomas for Gordon Hayward, and uh, let that be that. Uh, yeah, I appreciate the call. I mean, if you're sitting around in your Jeannie Buss and you're looking at this in Magic Johnson, you're saying De'Aaron Fox crushed LeVar Ball one-on-one. Do we know anything about De'Aaron Fox's family? L.A.'s got a lot of drama already. Do we need LeVar? Let's go to Briggs in Jacksonville. How you doing, Clay? Um, for me, I kind of agree, I agree with a lot of what you're saying. When I was watching it, I could not believe that he wasn't giving her eye contact. Yeah, like, that's that strange. Disres- I couldn't believe it. But at the same time, like I, I can't call it sexist because I don't know if he would have done it, like you said. Like, That's the question. What, re- what really rattled me was when they got into a heated argument, and like you said, like she wasn't going to let him, she wasn't going to back down, she's going to keep going. What really rattled me was when she said, are you threatening me? So that like took it to a whole nother level for me. Like it's a sports argument. Like it's, it, uh, I loved it. It's great for the NBA. It's great for basketball and sports. But like I couldn't believe she was saying, are you threatening me after you said you have something coming? Obviously this man is not going to threaten a woman, has a wife on national television. So I cannot believe she said that. Yeah, that was probably an overreaction. I don't think that was a threat. But I understand within the context, you've got something coming to you. I, what is he saying? Like, it's a very kind of open-ended statement. Like, that, that's karmically. Just, yeah, that's just slang. And I think what he meant was what he was giving her, the attitude he was giving her is what she had coming. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, and again, maybe that's what he meant. But but uh, I can understand her perspective of, like, that's an open-ended comment. What are you trying to say? 
And I also think stay in your lane. I would be curious if LeVar Ball has ever said stay in your lane to a guy. Because I think a lot of people who hear stay in your lane. And by the way, we haven't heard from a single woman. Uh, Maybe we should open up the phone lines and just let women react. Let's play that audio for you again. We got a lot of calls. People want to weigh in on this situation. We'll play the Christine Leahy and LeVar Ball uh, audio. If you haven't heard it from Colin Cowherd's show, The Herd, yesterday. Fantastic live radio. And if you're a woman out there listening right now, maybe I'm curious about what you think in particular. Did you feel or would you feel, based on the way he was talking to you, that you were being excluded from the conversation based on the fact that you're a woman? Which, again, I'm not usually the one to come out and say, oh, that's sexist, oh, that's racist, oh, that's phobe, transphobic, homophobic, whatever else. When I watched this, I thought LeVar Ball treated Christine Leahy differently because she was a girl. And that, to me, is the very definition of sexism, particularly in sports where maybe a lot of times people say, uh, if you're in a negative context, oh, women don't deserve to have their opinion heard. This is something women don't like in general. But certainly in the world of sports, women feel demeaned, I think, oftentimes when men say, oh, I'm not going to consider your opinion on this because you're a girl. I think that's sexist. And I think that's what LeVar Ball was basically doing. We'll talk about that more. 877-996-6369. I am Clay Travis. You're listening to Outkick the Coverage on Fox Sports Radio. Live from the Geico Fox Sports Radio studios. Great news. Quick way you could save money. Switch to Geico. Go to geico.com and in 15 minutes you could save 15% or more on car insurance. We're talking about the Lonzo Ball. Sorry, LeVar Ball. That's a problem for Lonzo. A lot of times... I say Lonzo and I mean LeVar. He's getting tarred and feathered by his father. If you haven't heard this audio, yesterday on The Herd, LeVar Ball, father of Lonzo Ball, was on to discuss his son likely going to the Lakers with the number two overall pick, and things got heated when Christine Leahy asked how many pairs of shoes they had sold. Like I said, there's different amounts. How many? Stay in your lane. Anyways, I'm just curious. I don't even worry about her over there. Like, Every why time not? she scares I think me that's to kind death. Of disrespectful. She says she scares Lonzo. Lonzo's scared of me. She scares me. That's why I don't look that way. I said that I wouldn't wear something that. It says big baller. It's the same thing. Yeah. With all due respect, you're a great reporter, just not reporting on me. Uh, Well, I I think in order to have a successful company, you're going to have to have women who like your brand. Uh, Oh yeah, if you have a women's company. But anyways. Oh, so you're not marketing. We're talking about big baller brand. Now that Lonzo's headed to Los Angeles, what they should have did is gave me a billion dollars and let me be on my way. That that's unrealistic. They're not unrealistic to you. No, it's now. You know what? If they want to come talk to me now, it just went up to $3 billion. Triple Bs. They wouldn't want to work with you anyway because you don't respect women. So I never disrespect women. But I tell you what, you if, you act, if you act like that, guess what? Something's coming to you. Oh. And it's okay. Do you, do you think... Are you, wait, are you threatening me? Oh, see how she tried to turn the words? I would never threaten you. You said something's coming to me. I don't know what it is. I'm not a psychic. Miranda in Knoxville, I tossed it out and said, I'd be curious what women would think. Do you think that he was being demeaning? Was this sexist of LeVar Ball? I don't know the answer. 877-996-6369. The poll question seemed to suggest yes. Six thousands of you voting so far. 63% of you say that you thought it was sexist. Miranda, was it sexist? You know, I'm not totally sold on the sexist idea. I kind of agree with Danny G when I just don't think uh, LeVar Ball likes Christine Leahy, which is which is fine. We don't like everyone. That being said, was it disrespectful? Yes. Was it demeaning? Yes. Was it inappropriate? Yes. However, um, I think it's probably on a grander scale. Like, let's think about PR, okay? Obviously, um, his son's going to be successful in the NBA. Whether he ends up with the Lakers or a different different NBA franchise, he's going to be successful. That being said, were, were these just like simple, like I'm being funny um, comments, or was this kind of like a bigger picture into, you know, if he goes to an organization that has a very strong female presence, are we going to be stepping on the toes of women? Are we going to be stepping on the toes? Should we start off maybe on a bad foot, like with PR? I mean, what's 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 LeVar Ball doing? He's trying to get paid, and he's making money off of his kid. Like, should we start out with being disrespectful? You know, whether it's, you know, obviously she's not the main host of, of Colin Cowherd's show, but should we start off, like, with that kind of demeanor where I'm going to say what I want and do what I want and be disrespectful to whom I want to? Is that somebody that I want representing? representing my organization and having my child, you know, be on this organization. Would you, if you were Jeannie Buss, a multimillionaire, billionaire owner of the Lakers, you're going to watch this interview or you're going to listen to it. Would it give you pause at all? Um, 
Yes, I, I think so, because like I said, I'm, I'm not totally sold on the sexism. I do think the problem is is that he does make multiple comments about, you know, Big Baller Brand isn't for women and she needs to stay in her lane. Like, is that somebody that you want coming? Obviously, he's going to be a huge part of his son's NBA career. Is this he's going to be courtside for every game. He's going to be talking to the media after every game. Yeah, and if we think the shoes are a big deal now, like, wait till he gets on the Lakers. Wait till he gets on whoever. I mean, he, it's, it's, you're getting – it's a two-part thing. It's kind of like dad – it's like a son and dad duo, right? So is this someone um, – and I believe a caller before me had mentioned the fact that where is the son's presence? Like, is he cool with this? Like, are you fine? Is this kind of – you're letting your dad carry you? Like, are you okay with him being disrespectful to a man or a woman? You know, I don't honestly – do I think, you know, he would say those comments to a man? No. I do believe he's been in other interviews where people have said things he hasn't disagreed with. But, you know, you just don't speak to a woman like that. You just don't disrespect anybody. But as, you know, a female – I'm. I'm in charge of the Lakers. I'm making all these big decisions. Is this someone I want speaking for me, you know, on my behalf? Is this who I want to represent my team? Are we already going to step on people's toes and be offensive and have to discuss men versus women? And, you know, obviously he's going to have to make some statement about this. So then the choice is, does he stand by what he says? Or do we do the whole apology, I would never be disrespectful to a woman, she took it out of context, like, which direction does he go with this? And keep in mind, we're talking about a man who has done nothing to be famous, but try to sell some shoes. And at the end of the day, we all want to know how many shoes have been bought. Like, inquiring minds want to know, like, how many of the big baller brand shoes have been sold? I would like to know. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Appreciate the call. Let's go to John in New York City. Hello? Yeah, you're with us. Okay, listen, she played the woman's card from the bottom of the deck. Come on, it was disgusting. She personally attacked him the night before on Speak Yourself. She said, I think his kids are scared of him. They're scared to speak up. I don't even think they had a choice on whether they could play basketball or not. I think they were made to play basketball. So she personally attacked his parenting. She personally attacked his family. No but isn't that fair game? Moment. Isn't that fair game when you're only famous? That is for... fair. That, 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 a, a, absolutely in the, in, the, in, the, in the respect play that he put himself out there, in the manner that he's gone about the marketing campaign, because his son is a little shy or doesn't want to get out there, and the hype that he's brought, hey, you bring that on yourself. It's going to come. With the good publicity comes the bad. But where it goes wrong is, he went in there, you could tell, he went in there with that chip on his shoulder that he was going to confront her, whether she was a man or a woman. And to, and what happened was it got lost in translation when he said, stay in your lane. And he said, uh, he, said he, he did reference the fact, you said Alonzo's scared. And as soon as she got confronted, she took it to, you're attacking me because I'm a woman. Are you threatening me? And he used slang terms uh, um, when he said, um, I forgot the, the exact quote, but it's almost like saying you're getting clapped back or it, it, different ter- terminology. But she, 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 the, the whole triggering thing she said, are you threatening me? No. What he was saying is if you say something, expect to be confronted. And you know what? We always talk about equality and women can stand on their own two feet. But when a man and a woman have an interaction like that, it's always said that, the, oh, look at the way that man talked to him. No, that was a confrontation. And we want equality for women. That had nothing to do about sexism or threatening, but that's where she took it. She was uncomfortable with confrontation. Some people do not do well in the confrontation. You know yourself. You went to law school. How many lawyers that work in law firms can't go into a courtroom because that's not their, their, where they can shine? They can, maybe, in a, maybe behind the scenes they write great, great briefs and everything, but when they get in the courtroom, maybe they freeze up. OK, that is it. When you get confronted, especially on live TV and the manner it was going to, to take that, it, it was it was a, it was an escape goat. It, 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 I just found it disgusting because if we go down that road, we're never anybody can say you're being racist. You're being sexist. You're, it, it, it so you think I'd be in a pussy willow for thinking this was sexist? 
oh my god, there's nothing sexist about. It. He, Good stuff, he John. I gotta, I gotta go to trending. Tyrone agrees with you in Birmingham. We're going to go to him next. He says I'm being a pussy willow about this entire process. He may be right. Who knows? We'll talk to Tyrone next. Your phone calls, 877-996-6369. I am Clay Travis. You're listening to Outkick the Coverage. Here's what's trending now. Welcome back. Fox Sports Radio Studios brought to you by GEICO. Easy to save 15% or more on car insurance with GEICO. Go to GEICO.com or call 800-947-AUTO. The only hard part, figuring out which way is easier as well. With True Car, you can find out what other people in your area paid for the same car you're looking for and on average save over three grand off MSRP. Whether you're looking for a new or used car, visit True Car to enjoy a more confident car buying experience. A lot of you confident in different opinions uh, about whether or not LeVar Ball was being sexist on the herd. And Tyrone in Birmingham says, I'm being a pussy willow. You can react as well, 877-996-6369. Tyrone, what's up? Am I being a pussy willow about this? If, if LeBron James, in your words, is the king of the millennials, you are the king of the pussy willow. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, look, I, I expect the other side of the argument. So, basically, you believe – so, in order to have your argument, you think LeVar Ball would talk the same way to a guy. Oh, yeah. You, if that was you, especially you, if he <laughs> followed you, <laughs> talk to the hand. There's no <laughs> question about it, man. This guy is six, six – listen, remember what we're talking about here. This guy says he could beat Michael Jordan one on one in his prime. Yes. So you know, we do. Clay, I want to give you a good experiment. I don't know if you'll do it now. You're there in Nashville, so you're going to have a black barbershop. Take your three boys to a black barbershop one Saturday, and you're going to see multiple law bar balls in there making just unbelievable statements. Yes. Now, Christine, Christine, uh, uh, initially, when she asked the question, well, how many have you sold? Like that, he said, talk to the ham, I'm not talking to you. He was playing, but she took it to the next level, and he made compliments. He said, you're a great reporter. You're just not good reporting on me. All right? When he said, when she said, oh, you're threatening me? When he said, you got something coming to you, that only meant, people have, 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 have went up to it but didn't say it, that only meant that I'm going to say something back to you. It didn't mean it was going to come over there and, and hit her or anything. I'm like, bro, she is tripping or whatever. She was totally out of line. You know he's a clown. And Carlin started laughing as soon as he said, talk to the land. You go back and listen to her. Uh, Carlin started laughing. And how lucky is Carlin to have this to happen and other people are talking about it? You know, it's like Oh, the you're right effort. about that because as soon well, as this happened. That's the luckiest MF it is, dog. Golly. I know you just beg for stuff like that to happen. With your oh, guest. Amen. Amen. As soon as it happened, I said, this is Radio Girl. I, I'm not kidding about you. I texted Cowherd as soon as I heard it. I texted everybody who was involved in this situation. Because uh, I know, again, I know Colin well. I think Colin's incredibly talented at what he does. I, Christine, I think, is really good at what she does. It's a great show, The Herd. Uh, and obviously, I'm good friends with Whitlock. You guys have heard him on the show quite a bit. But as soon as it happened, I texted Colin Cowherd yesterday, literally like 10 minutes after it happened, radio period, gold period. I mean, it was. It was incredible radio gold. Thanks for the call, Tyrone. I mean, I, I watched – I'm king of the pussy willows today, uh, according to Tyrone. I need to get that T-shirt made. I, I watched this thing happen. I loved the line about snacks with Whitlock. Um, I thought it was pretty funny. I texted Whitlock as soon as I heard it, like, this is great for you. And, again, i got to give credit to our Fox Sports radio crew. They had that thing out there almost immediately. I think what it was was authentic. And I think people respond well to authenticity, even if it isn't necessarily – as beautiful as you would like authenticity to be, right? I think that was authentic live radio. You don't know what's going to happen from one moment to the next. I thought it was great for the herd. I thought it was great for Leahy. And you know what? As much criticism as LeVar Ball may get, and as many of you as may think that he was sexist or a bit of an ass, even more so than normal, I say this all the time. There is no such thing as bad publicity as long as you aren't facing jail time. LeVar Ball is a perfect test of this. If Lonzo ends up going two to the Lakers, all he's done is burnish the big baller brand. Now, I don't know how good Lonzo's going to be, but it's a fascinating question. Absolutely fascinating. Uh, let's go to uh, David in West Palm Beach. Hey, uh, big fan of your show. Um, 
I don't. I guess we could put this in, in a vacuum. I don't believe it was sexist, but there definitely was a great deal of disrespect towards Christine. Um, you could see in his body language. You know, he didn't face her when he was talking to her. And, you know, um, Lavar's a, a, a playful guy, and, and he, he behaves like that often. But um, I don't want to say it was sexist, but it definitely leaves a lot. Of- Did we lose him? Did he, did he get sniped there? Thanks for the call. Let's go to uh, let's see, Ralph in Coral Springs. Ralph, what's up? Hey, Clay, I, I just wanted to make a statement. I'm, I'll say if you agree with me on this. I mean, at this stage of the game, don't you think that, you know, first of all, he should divorce his father, okay, prove himself in the NBA, all right? Because at this stage of the game, everybody's saying, oh, he's going to be a great player, great player. And that hasn't even been proven. Prove yourself, sell your shoes, because you're not only drafting, you know, it's the son, you're drafting the father, which doesn't make any sense for any team to take him because what are you going to do? He's going to get scrutinized, and, and this guy, LeVar, is going to come out for every single game and, and run his mouth off. Who wants to deal with that as an owner? That's a good question, and that's the big debate. I Just why I said, if you're Jeannie Buss and you're a female, powerful owner of the L.A. Lakers, do you watch this interaction and say, I don't want to deal with that for the next five years or the next ten years or the next 15 years? if I draft Lonzo Ball? Or are we going to get at some point kind of a, a, a disunion like we have seen happen with athletes before? Eventually, the Williams sister said, Dad, about Richard Williams, stop talking to the media. We're the superstars here, Venus and Serena. People care about us, not you. Lonzo Ball's play is ultimately going to have to do the talking. And also, Lonzo Ball's play is going to have to cash a lot of checks to make up for what his dad is trying to sell. We got Animal Thunderdome news for you in the final segment of Hour 2. You're not going to believe what we have tracked down. This is Outkick the Coverage on Fox Sports Radio. Live from the Geico Fox Sports Radio studios, what does it mean when Geico says just 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance? It means you probably should have gone to geico.com 15 minutes ago. All right. Going to get to your calls here in a moment to finish off the hour, but first, important Animal Thunderdome news. Cue the music, boys. Ladies and gentlemen. I'm just glad I was there. Boys and girls. I thought he thought I was like this ginormous piece of chicken. Dying times here. This is Animal Thunderdome. We go to the state of Florida, a fecund wonderland of many different animal delights. Authorities say a Florida man leaned in to kiss a rattlesnake, but got bitten instead. This is from Bostwick, Florida. The unidentified man was bitten on the tongue Tuesday in the Bostwick area. No idea where Bostwick is. I go to Florida tomorrow. For two weeks. Hopefully I'll survive. And he had to be airlifted to a hospital where he was listed in critical condition. I hope he's not died since then. Do we know if he's still alive? I don't know. We'll have to do research. WTLV in Jacksonville quoted a friend of the victim as saying he'd been drinking while handling the seemingly calm eastern diamondback rattlesnake. But when he moved toward the reptile as if to kiss it, the snake bit him. It wasn't immediately clear where the snake came from. It is illegal to keep a rattlesnake in Florida without a license. They have rattlesnake licenses in Florida? A rattlesnake license? Oh, my God. That is Animal Thunderdome news. Let's get to your calls quickly here. Uh, Karina in Texas. Hey, um, thanks for taking my call. As a, if I was a female basketball team owner, I would probably still draft him because he's probably going to do well, but he's going to have to do well. Um, but I was calling also to say, you know, as a mom, the person that buys the shoes and the clothing, I wouldn't buy that. I wouldn't buy his stuff for my boys just because I listening to his dad. But I also think your your callers are right. He he probably was just doing this to get more publicity, and we're still talking about it a day later. He's a genius when it comes to publicity. I heard it. What? He, he's a I'm genius sorry. when it comes to publicity, and and I think it's a good oh, point. Yeah. Like you would be less likely to buy your kids shoes for Levar Ball because, as a mom, you'd be like, "This guy's an ass. I'm not buying the shoes," based on many exactly. reasons, but probably also his treatment of Christine Leahy. 
Yeah, I mean, I just I thought he came across as an idiot in Texas. I think he would talk like that to anybody that maybe disagreed with him. You know, he doesn't he doesn't seem to have any you know finesse for anything except for my son's the greatest of all time, right? Yeah, no, I appreciate the call uh, from Karina down in Texas. Let's go to Greg and Roanoke. Going to try to get you guys in quickly here as we finish the hour off. Greg, what's up? Hey, um, first off, I want to say um, I I never understood why Christine had the gig she had. Uh, I assumed it was just because she was an attractive female. Um, but what happened yesterday really confirmed that stance for me. Um, I didn't necessarily agree with Paul's treatment of her. Of her. But once she started to play the sexism card, that's when I started to fall. And it's, um, I liken that to why I voted for Trump. Uh, I don't always agree with, with the things or the way it's presented. But once you represent pushback to this social justice BS, I'm on your side. So, yeah, okay. No, I mean, look, I, I think you're right. I think that's the reason Donald Trump got elected. I think people were tired of a bunch of pussy willows out there. And we had... Tyrone called in and said, right, that I was a pussy willow. And that's it's true. You don't have to agree with me. I think this was sexist. I don't think he would have treated a guy in the exact same way. I could be totally wrong. I could be totally wrong about that. And you could be right. He could have treated everybody the exact same. Mike, Mike in Pittsburgh. Mike, what's up? Uh, hey, uh, Clay. How's everything? Excellent. Oh, good. Hey, look, I, I wouldn't call you uh, any names just for having an opinion that disagrees with mine, but I wanted to say if you didn't have a problem with uh, Jason Whitlock, them telling him that he would, uh, all he can talk is snacks, what if Christine was overweight and he said all she could talk about was snacks? You know, I mean, it, it's like there is a double standard there. And when he said stay in your lane, I didn't take it as, um, like, he's being sexist. I just thought that it's it's not the, the herd with Colin and Christine. It's the herd with Colin Cowherd. Like, she's not a 50-50 co-host. And he was basically saying, like, you read the news and you interact with Colin from time to time when he's talking. But right now I'm here to have a conversation with Colin. So, you know. Stay over there. Please don't talk to me. That being said, it was 70% LeVar's fault. And Christine, like like the last caller said, she basically, I think, was clinching when she said, are you threatening me? She wasn't prepared for what LeVar was doing, and she needed a couple extra seconds to think. So the threatening me thing kind of pushed LeVar back and gave her a little breathing time to kind of recollect herself. Appreciate the call. You guys have been great. Got to give callers some props here. A lot of times Twitter outperforms the callers. I think the callers actually held up their own here so far today. Final hour of the show coming up next. I think it's going to be fantastic. It's going to be spectacular. It's going to be extraordinary on Fox Sports Radio. Welcome back. Hour 3 Fox Sports Radio Studios brought to you by GEICO. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. Visit GEICO.com for a free rate quote. As well, as always, remember... Duralast batteries, proven tough, designed to stand up to even the most extreme weather conditions with patented technology to deliver the most power during startup. Get in the zone, auto zone. We're always in the zone here. I'm Clay Travis. You're listening to Outkick the Coverage. And a uh, couple different big stories out there, obviously. The Cavs eliminate the Boston Celtics from the Eastern Conference Finals. Uh, it's only one game, but that series is completely over. We didn't talk about this very much so far, but I do think it's worth mentioning. There is an awful lawsuit that is pending again in the state of Texas, and I wanted to read you a couple of these quotes because it's unbelievable. The Baylor fallout continues. The Baylor fallout continues, and it's an unbelievable situation that's going on down in Waco. And this latest lawsuit, again, it's just allegations, but I wanted to read this to you because I couldn't believe it when I saw it. This is from the complaint itself. Down in Baylor. It is a Title IX lawsuit, and it alleges that there's a culture of sexual violence. Upon information and belief, upon plaintiff, prior to plaintiff's arrival at Baylor, members of the Baylor football team had already developed a system of hazing their freshman recruits by having them bring or invite freshman females to house parties hosted by members of the football team. At these parties, the girls would be drugged and gang-raped, or in the words of the football players, trains would be run on the girls. The gang-rapes were considered a bonding experience for the football players, 
Photographs and videotapes of the semi-conscious girls would be taken during the gang rapes and circulated amongst the football players. Based upon investigation, plaintiff has confirmed that at least one 21-second videotape of two female Baylor students being gang raped by several Baylor football players was circulated amongst football players. Baylor football parties would also feature dogfighting. In at least one of the matches, a dog was seriously injured and almost died. Simply put, Baylor football under Bryles had run, or that's Art Bryles, had run wild in more ways than one, and Baylor was doing nothing to stop it. What an unbelievable story Baylor football has become. Dogfighting and gang rapes. I don't know what you could say that would surprise me about Baylor football other than the fact that maybe they got a Nobel Prize nomination. One of the most dark and disturbing stories that we have had in college athletics in a long time. If I were ranking scandals in modern-day college athletics, I would say Penn State is still the worst scandal that we've probably ever seen in the history of college sports. Covering up child rape as long as they did in Happy Valley Unbelievable. And also, I think, a ridiculous situation going on at Baylor right now and then further what happened at Florida State with covering up Jameis Winston. Those are the three, I think, biggest modern-day scandals. And it's crazy to me that we spend a lot of time worrying about something that's not significant at all, like Ole Miss potentially paying players or or Southern Cal having a uh, issue with everything else associated with uh, Reggie Bush. All of those things are absurd and ridiculous. And it's crazy to me what stories we end up following and which ones we don't. It's a wild kind of situation in general. We have been reacting to the LeVar Ball story, everything that surrounds LeVar Ball and everything about him and his relationship with Christine Leahy. We are going to be going to a guest Interestingly, that I think you guys are really going to enjoy a guy by the name of Seth Stevens Davidowitz wrote a book called Everybody Lies about how Google Analytics is changing the way we look at what people say versus what they actually do. And many of the details inside of it are, I think, going to be pretty stunning to you guys. And we're going to talk with him next. And we also, I think, are going to be able to get to John Morosi, talk a little bit about the Preds and the Anaheim Ducks game which is going on tonight. I want to bring in my crew, uh, Danny G and Justin. Uh, Danny G and Justin, what is too much in your mind to pay for a sporting event? Like for a ticket? Wow. I, Does it matter what kind of sport? So I, the reason why I'm asking is I have got right now the SeatGeek app open on my phone, <laughs> and I want to go tonight to game four of the wow. uh, of this series. Well, we know what your wife pays for concert tickets. Right, exactly. Um, so my theory and maybe I'm a spoiled brat in this respect now, but if I'm going to go to a game, especially a hockey game, I want to be on the ice. Right? I want to be down close because otherwise I'd just rather watch it in HD at home. I'm not going to sit in the upper deck. What do you think? This is this blows me away right now cuz Nashville's not exactly known as a hockey town. What do you think the cost is for lower level seats? at the Preds Arena tonight for the Ducks game is? Cheapest seat right now. Cheapest seat for, uh, I'm going to say down on the ice you're talking? I mean, there's, so just so you know, there's like three levels at the Preds Arena. There's the lower level, and it's like 50 rows, right? There's the second level, which is like the club seats. Got it. And then there's the third level. There's only three levels in the arena. So when I say, and I don't mean like, directly on the ice. I don't mean like you're on the glass, but I'm just saying the lower level, meaning like the bottom 50 rows. I hear you. Okay. Oh, man. Uh, I'm going to say $500. $500. $500 is the cheapest seat right now for the lower level of the Preds Arena. Man. Would you pay $500 for a hockey game ticket like that? I, I know it factors in on some level with income because people can be like, oh, you know, if you make $25,000 a year, that's a lot different than making $250,000 a year when it comes to the overall cost that you're willing to pay. But is it crazy that I'm just, I, like I told my wife earlier, uh, last night we went to bed. She's like, are we going to go to the game tomorrow? I said, look, I want to go to the game. I want us to go to the game. But I'm not willing to pay $1,000 for two people because I'm having to pay for two tickets, right? Would I be willing to pay 500 for one if I was going with a buddy? Maybe. But when you're paying for two tickets, that's $1,000. 
Is that – am I being a pussy willow there for not being willing to spend that kind of money? And then, look, I'm not willing to go. People can say, well, you can go – the cheapest ticket in the place is 300 bucks to get in in the upper deck, but I'm certainly not going to pay $300 to go sit in the upper deck and have a much worse view than I would to just sit in front of my television on HD. Like, if I go, I want to have good seats. Is that a crazy perspective? Well, I think it's probably fair to say that you're more of a, a casual Predators fan – if I, if I remember correctly, you you were able to name like what was it two or three, yeah players. So so no, I don't I don't think it's crazy to not want to spend that. The most I've ever spent, I, I think I spent close to four hundred dollars to go see uh, the Lakers in an NBA Finals game, and so that was completely worth it for me. I would have were those good seats or were they just get in seats? Uh, th- it was lower bowl and uh, it was like the corner. So I mean. It was probably the worst that you could have in the lower bowl, but still, it was lower bowl. There are hardly any seats available. Jason Martin, you're going as a member of the media. What is the number that you think is a ridiculous amount to pay to go watch a hockey game? I guess it depends on your disposable income. I mean, if I were you, I'd drop $1,000. Me, <laughs> I wouldn't drop 250 for So two am tickets. I being I mean, cheap, it's though? Just, it's like I, I, Now I have a good income, right? But I can't help when I look at ticket good. prices of thinking in the same way like – I wasn't born rich. I wasn't born with a lot of money. So, And I didn't have a lot of money for most of my life. Now I do have a lot of money compared to, to most people. But I still look at it in the context of there is – I'm not one of those people who's just like, oh, I want to do something. I'm going to pay whatever it costs. Like I look at it and I say I can't justify paying $1,000 mm-hmm. for me and my wife to go watch a game. Yeah, and I agree with that to an extent. It's like you have to look at it and say, all right, this is three hours of our lives for $1,000. And, you know, you were talking to me, Justin was talking about being in an NBA Finals game for the Lakers. It's like you're going for the experience. It's like I'm thinking about it. Okay, I've never been to a conference finals uh, in any sport, as a matter of fact, at least in any pro sport. So, yes, I'm going to go as a member of the media. If I had to pay for that ticket as much as I'd like to be there, probably would have priced me out, especially with just moving to Nashville and having some other expenses and things like that. But, you know, you, you think about it. You look at your relationship to that team, to that city, all that. It's like, I want to be in that building and see that atmosphere. How much would I pay for that? Maybe 200 bucks, But I don't think I could go any higher than that. Now, again, I look at my bank account compared to some of the people that would easily pull that off. But I do think you make a solid point about, you know, you're not somebody that just flosses out and, you know, goes and grabs a Lamborghini. And there's a lot of people and there's a lot to be said for the idea that a lot of people that have built themselves rich, not the ones that have fallen bass backwards into it, but the ones that have really worked to become wealthy are that way because they don't spend every cent that they have. And they still value every cent that they make, and they're still looking to make every new cent that well, they possibly I'm still, can. I'm still spoiled here in that I won't just pay. Like, I used to be, I'll, I don't really care where I sit guy. Like, when I wrote my first book, Dixieland Delight, I had crappy seats in SEC football stadiums all over the Southeast. I literally sat for the SEC title game that year between Florida and Arkansas back in 2006 when I was writing this book. I literally had the worst seat in the Georgia Dome for the SEC title game. I mean, it was almost impossible. Like, I was in the last row, literally the last row of the Georgia Dome in the upper deck because that was the best seat that I could afford at the time. Nowadays, like I'm not going to go buy a seat in the upper deck and climb all the way to the very top of the arena just to be inside the the arena. Like if I go, I want to have decent seats. But a thousand dollars for two people to go watch Game Four in the Preds Ducks game, and again, it's Thursday night. There's nothing else going on in the world of sports. It's not like there's an NBA game even taking place tonight. I think it's an interesting question. That's the most expensive tickets I've ever seen for a event like this. I mean, a non individual game I understand if it's like a college football game and it's only happening once or it's a you know it's a NCAA tournament you know championship game something like that this is a seven game series potentially so it's not like it's just happening once to me that's kind of wild okay we've got an interesting uh guest coming up right now he is Seth Stevens Davidovitz and he what he did is he's using Google Analytics to prove how much people lie about what they say they do versus what they actually do. The book is called Everybody Lies. It's incredible. The subtitle is Big Data, New Data, What the Internet Can Tell Us About Who We Really Are. He's a huge sports fan, and there's a lot of sports knowledge in here. I read this book in one day, sat down and powered through it. I was blown away by how good it was, by how smart it was. I'd encourage you guys to go check it out. Everybody Lies is the book. We're going to talk to him next. Things like what are the odds of being an NBA player based on your height? 
uh, what is uh, what is the uh, what is the perspective when it comes to uh, to what people actually are willing to do? There's so much fascinating sports in here. I'm telling you, you're not going to want to miss this. It's coming up next on Fox Sports Radio. Out kick the coverage here with y'all coming up next. Live from the Geico Fox Sports Radio studios, what does it mean when Geico says just 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance? It means you probably should have gone to geico.com 15 minutes ago. This guy just published a great book. It's called Everybody Lies, Big Data, New Data, and What the Internet Can Tell Us About Who We Really Are. I loved this because for what I do, people say, oh, why do you talk about LeVar Ball? Oh, why do you talk about Colin Kaepernick? Oh, why do you talk about Tebow? Before that, why are you writing about Brett Favre? People say, oh, I don't care about this anymore. And then what's fascinating is I can see the analytics on what people are reading and what people are clicking on and everything else. And guess what? You're all lying to me. When you say you don't care about the story that's typically being covered, you're wrong because I see what you actually care about, and it's different than what you say you care about. And we bring in now the author of this book, Seth Stevens Davidowitz. Davidowitz. Uh, And Seth, I appreciate you coming on with this great book. Again, the book just came out, Everybody Lies. LeVar Ball is a perfect example to me of what you write about, which is the Google analytic data of what people actually want versus what they say they want is oftentimes very different, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think uh, you also just saw it when uh, you know ESPN fired all these people, and everyone was complaining that these are, they fired all the serious journalists. They don't want to hear Stephen A. Smith. Why they keep Stephen A. Smith? But that's all anybody wants to watch. So uh, I think in general, if people say one thing and do something completely different, and you see this in business and politics and uh, research, kind of everywhere. And there's been a lot of talk about analytics and sports. And, and you guys, your book has a lot of sports related. You are a sports fan. And I want to hit you with several of these questions because I thought the data in this was amazing. You talk about how the age of when someone becomes a fan is impacted by the success of teams that surround those, those, uh, those eras. What age does someone actually become a fan in the research that you've seen? And how is it impacted by what's going on in the world of sports at that time? Yeah, so you see, I did a study of baseball, and you see that uh, there are unusual number of Mets fans uh, who were born in 1978 and 1961. Well, why 1961, why 1978? Well, they were eight years old when the Mets won a World Series. Uh, and on average, uh, when people tend to be fan, the, the biggest uh, impact predictor of whether you're going to be a family or you're an adult is how good the team was between the ages of 5 and 12, and the most important year is uh, age 8. You, so you kind of get stuck with the team that, that was good when you were eight years old. Another aspect of your book that I found fascinating was height as it relates to becoming an NBA player. And this this stat was um, that blew my mind. You said that of everybody out there who is seven feet tall, legitimately seven feet tall, you basically have a one in five chance of playing in the NBA if you were seven feet tall, which is an amazing percent. Like there aren't that many seven footers, obviously, but one in five, that blew me away. Yeah, that blew me away, too. And yeah, it's just kind of insane uh, how much height matters in the NBA. And uh, I think uh, each inch you you grow doubles your chances of making the NBA throughout the height uh, distribution. So, so that, that, I want you to, I want you to hit that again. I want you to hit that again because I read that, that in your book, and I was blown away by it. Every inch of height that you are, that you grow, doubles your chances of making the NBA. So put that into context for a guy like Isaiah Thomas as it would be compared – to a guy like uh, who's a big seven footer, you know, uh, right now that's successful. God, there's not very many of them yeah, anymore, so, are there? But but it's amazing to think about. Yeah, yeah. So so and so that kind of happened throughout the height distribution. So if you're six one, you're twice as likely to make the NBA six than if you're six foot. And if you're uh, and and if you're seven foot, you're twice as likely to make uh, the NBA than if you're six eleven. Uh, and yeah, it it just shows how remarkable Isaiah Thomas is. Uh, to, to have made the NBA at that height because it really is uh, is incredibly rare. If, if you're under, uh, so if, if you're over seven foot, you have as, as you said a one in five chance of making it. If you're under six foot, you have a, a one in a million chance of making the NBA. 
That's an amazing stat. So if you're under six feet tall, one in a million. If you are over seven feet, one in five. And I know that, again, yeah. probably doesn't strike people necessarily as, as crazy because you think about it six foot versus uh, under six feet, 5'11", versus a seven foot guy. But I think it really kind of brings home the insanity of it. You also, in this data, you get into some fascinating questions and, and, and analysis. You also found you're 40 times as likely to make the NBA if you are black as if you are white. Yeah, I mean, that one also probably doesn't shock. I mean, if you look at the NBA and you look at, uh, you know, other aspects of American life, you, you notice a big difference. But uh, that, that, yeah, the, the, that, those are the numbers. So uh, it's pretty huge. when you get a fact like that, and it's a fact, it's not racism playing in, like that's a fact. You're 40 times statistically as likely to make the NBA if you are black as if you are white. How do you present yeah. a fact without worrying about the racial component of it getting r- kind of rolled up into it and everybody saying, oh, this is racist to talk about when it's a fact? I mean, that's the reality of what the NBA reflects. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm just a data a data guy, so I'm kind of clueless to social norms. <laughs> so I just say what I find and then uh, let the let the chips fall where they may, I guess. But, uh, and, yeah, I mean, I, I – I don't really see why why that's uh, you know why why that would be uh, you know something not to say. I just find it really interesting. I, I love it. I mean, it, it, the data says what the data says. Facts matter, and you know, and again, that's that's a that's a great stat in your book. Again, we're talking to Seth Stevens Davidovitz. His book Everybody Lies is out. It's a great read. I read it in one day. Uh, another aspect of this, and again, it's all about data. And I would encourage you guys if you're kind of fascinated by the stories that that we tell. Um, you also looked at. There's this idea out there that people who come from nothing in the world of sports want it more, that they work harder, that it's better to be basically coming from nothing and become a sports star than to be coming from a middle-class household. And you looked at that from an NBA perspective to try to see, wait a minute, are the people who are more likely to succeed in the NBA really coming from inner-city neighborhoods with single parents or are they more likely to be coming from dual income, stable parental households? And I thought, at least as we're talking about the NBA and the NBA playoffs, that your results here were striking and intriguing as well. Yeah. So that, yeah. So there's been this idea for basketball for a while that you know how can suburban kids compete with you know inner city kids in poverty? They they want it so much more. They need they're desperate uh, to to make it in the NBA because they have no options and that's just totally not true in the data. In the data actually you're about twice as likely to reach the NBA if you come from a middle class background than a poorer background. Uh, so it's a huge advantage to come from a two parent home to come from uh, the middle class or even upper middle class uh to co- to come from uh, parents not not to not come from teenage moms. I mean there are obviously exceptions. There's LeBron James who uh, was born to a single teenage mom, uh, and his father was in jail. But that's uh, really the exception. Uh, and uh, that, that, that uh, on average, you see more people like uh, 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 like Michael Jordan, I guess, is a classic example, who came from a two-parent uh, middle-class home, if, if were born in Brooklyn and, and raised in North Carolina. And you said also that if you listen to an NBA game, that also will make sense sometimes because you can tell by names, literally. I think the Freakonomics guys did an analysis based on the uniqueness of names, whether or not you could almost tell based on educational value, educational levels based on names. And you pointed out, like, yeah. if you listen to an NBA game now, like, for instance, the Golden State Warriors, you've got Steph and Clay and Kevin, you know, three guys who sound like that's pretty suburban names, right? Steph and Clay and Kevin. Yeah. They happen to be black guys who are three of the best basketball players in the world. But it isn't exactly sounding like it's an inner city, you know, ga- name, right? Right, exactly. So, so poor, so African Americans from poorer backgrounds tend to have unique names like LeBron or, or names that are, aren't given to, to anybody uh, else in that year, uh, made up names. But uh, if you look at, if you listen to the NBA, and that this is, you know, among poor African Americans, about thirty uh, percent of names will be unique names that you've never heard before. But if you listen to the NBA, there are a few of them, but there aren't that many. There are many more names like uh, Kevin or Steph or Michael uh, or James. So yeah, uh, that that basically you, you can you can tell the if you just listen closely, you see that the that you you see where where the NBA players really come from, which is from better backgrounds. 
We're talking to Seth Stevens Davidovitz. Last question for you. What surprised you in the world of sports? And this book is not just about sports. It's about data in the modern era. Book's called Everybody Lies. I read it in a day. I can't tell you how good it is. What surprised you maybe the most as a sports fan about data that you have found that didn't necessarily correspond with what you expected to find? Uh I did this study on, on Super Bowl ads. It wasn't sports in general, but on the effects of Super Bowl, Bowl ads. Yes, it was an incredible, incredible section of the book. Yeah, so you can't, so the, like, I think that these, who the hell buys these stupid Super Bowl ads? You put a celebrity, you know, next to pistachios. Like, is that really going to make you buy pistachios? But you see very clearly in the, like, you can, the way to test it is to compare uh, Product purchases in cities that that made the super of teams that made the Super Bowl and cities of teams that just missed the Super Bowl, and you see a huge uptick in these in these product purchases. So these seemingly stupid ads are incredibly effective, and that really really surprised me. Yeah, that, that's a great part of the book. You looked at tele at movie advertisements, and you adjusted it based yeah, on exactly. the teams that were playing in the Super Bowl, and tried to compare the gate for a movie. And you found that these ads, even though they might cost five million dollars pay for themselves sometimes two and three times over in terms of the reaction that they provoke among the audience that's watching. Yeah, exactly. Just tons and tons of people are affected by these ads. And I think advertising in general is probably more effective than we like to think because I think people like to think that they're not that influenced by advertising. Uh, But uh, I think we all are uh, very much influenced by advertising. Appreciate the time, Seth. I know how busy you are doing promotion for this book. Again, I can't recommend it highly enough. Everybody lies. Seth Stevens, Davidowitz, it is out just recently. I read it in one day. If you like anything about what it's called, Everybody Lies, because everybody lies about their Google Analytics. Appreciate the time, my man. Uh, And also now it is time for trending. On the flip side, we're going to talk to John Morosi. He's in town to cover the Preds and the Anaheim Ducks tonight. Also, we'll talk about Major League Baseball and more with him. But first, let's find out what's trending now. Welcome back. Fox Sports Radio Studios brought to you by GEICO. It's easy to save 15% or more on car insurance with GEICO. Go to GEICO.com or call 800-947-AUTO. The only hard part, figuring out which way is easier as well as with True Car, you can find out what other people in your area paid for the same car you're looking for and on average save over three grand off MSRP. Whether you're looking for a new or used car, visit True Car to enjoy a more confident car buying experience. John Morosi in with us now as he is every single Thursday, and you're actually in the same city as us for a change. John, you're down here covering the Western Conference uh, NHL playoffs, Preds hosting the Anaheim Ducks game four. What was your experience like in game three, and what do you think of this playoff series so far? Incredible, Clay. And and certainly I had heard from so many fans and and so many people that work in the game that the the atmosphere at Bridgestone Arena right now is is the best in the NHL. And I would have to, from my experience, agree from the standpoint of the, the, the noise of the building, the chants. Uh, I love the live music that, that you have there in between periods at Bridgestone Arena. So um, everything about it lived up to the hype. And I really think as well, you look at the way Game 3 unfolded, and the Predators crowd, I believe, played a pivotal role in the way that the, the game unfolded. I think that in the third period, um, you, you thought maybe there were, uh, there were there was a decent chance that Anaheim could hold them off. Of course, Anaheim enters that period with a lead after uh, scoring the power play goal following the fight in the second period, which was a story unto itself. But the way that you saw the third period unfold, you saw just and heard, actually, just how much of an influence the Predators crowd has right now. It was remarkable the way that even as two goals were disallowed, and, and yes, there was kind of a, a uh, an unfortunate moment where there was some debris thrown on the ice, but, but for the most part, I think that was a, a, an extremely positive way of having a hockey crowd not get discouraged and actually propelled the team to a victory, and Mike Fisher, the Preds captain, uh, pointed out, he said to me afterward, that I don't think that, that crowd sat down once during the third period. So it was remarkable to hear uh, someone that's played in the Cup Final before 10 years ago and been in this league for a very long time uh, to, really, to really acknowledge just how powerful the, the impact of the crowd was on the result of that game. How even is this series? Clay, to me, it has been uh, extremely even. I, I think the Preds have been... Uh, the slightly better team. Uh, I, I think that uh, if, if you were to ask, and clearly it's, it's a 2 1 series lead for Nashville, but it's been very even. And, and I think because we have seen uh, Anaheim was the better team 
probably in the in the first period of game three. They were the better team in the latter two periods, I believe, of game two. Um, and, and when Anaheim has been able to establish their forecheck, uh, they have been able to, I think, carry the play. But, uh, but Nashville, I think, by and large, in, in the greater number of periods, uh, they've had the shot advantage uh, over the entire series at this point in time. But it's been a very competitive series, and I think Anaheim's experience, Clay, at different times has shown up. And, and their defense, of course, very young and very mobile as well, as, of course, as we know Nashville's is. So I think it's been a very, very uh, tightly contested series. John Gibson's been good, but not quite as good as Pecorine. And Pecorine answered a lot of questions today coming off of giving up those four goals. Uh, on Sunday in Game 2, uh, phenomenal effort by Pecorino there in Game 3. We bring you on because you can talk about multiple sports. You're here for the NHL, but you're also covering Major League Baseball. Derek Jeter retired. We haven't spent a lot of time talking about uh, this. It seems like his retirement ceremony has been going on forever. What did you think about his final appearance there maybe in Yankee Stadium, kind of wearing that number 2 aura around him? From now on, he's going to firmly be, if he wasn't already, a uh, belong to the history of, of baseball fans and, and certainly the illustrious history of the Yankees. What is his long-term legacy going to be, and what did you think of what I guess can be classified as somewhat of a final goodbye for him? Well, well Clay, to me, uh, first of all, uh, I, I thought it was very interesting and very poignant uh, that, that MLB.com uh, put together that, that bracket of, uh, of greatest Jeter moments and had fans actually be able to vote on it. And and the thought that I had following that, Clay, was for for how many other players in baseball could you even conceive of something similar right now? And I don't think there is anyone that's even close in terms of being able to have a fill out an actual bracket of 16 different moments. Uh, when you think about it, you know, you and I have spoken a lot about Mike Trout, Bryce Harper, what their careers can become. Can you can you name five uh, indelible Bryce Harper moments or Trout moments to start filling out a bracket? I realize they're very young, but the point is with Jeter, many of those moments happened in the first five or six years of his career when the when the Yankees were in their late nineties heyday and he was winning a World Series. It seemed like every single year, which of course was true for three consecutive years, and then of course they added the fourth and five years. So to me, Clay, it just was a tribute to a career the likes of which we are not seeing right now and may never see again because so many things had to go exactly right for him. He had to show up at the right time for the right team, be drafted by the right team when, when of course, the Astros famously passed on him when they should have taken him. Um, all these different moments, much like Jordan in that respect, where he just, he just went to the right team even though they didn't pick first. Um, so many things happened just exactly right. And I think it was, it was a reminder to me that we are, we are not going to see, I believe, uh, someone of that, of, of that type of nature in a very, very long time come back. And, and I think, too, Clay, it was a useful, to, to your point, closing of, of that chapter because who knows, in a year's time, you might be the owner of the Marlins. He might be involved in, in, in the business of baseball in some other way. So I think it was important that this moment happened before that aspect of his career gets going. And I think it was just one more uh, perfect tribute in a, in a career that you think about his last swing at Yankee Stadium. Uh, it, it just could not have been more storybook for Derek Jeter. Houston Astros have the best record in baseball right now at you know, roughly uh, 16, 17 games over 500. Right. Is that going to be able to be sustained? Do you think that they're for real? Uh, their winning percentage, I think, eventually will come down a little bit uh, because it's just so hard. You know, in, in baseball, very rare. If you, if you look at the standings at any given time, and it's even true right now, it, it's, it's sort of an interesting little baseball experiment. Go there and, and count the number of teams whose winning percentage is higher than 600 or lower than 400. It almost never happens. I mean, there's maybe a handful of teams that are either great or really awful at any particular time, but it's you can count them on one hand. It's the old, it's the old canard, right? Baseball, exactly. they always said you're going to win 60 and lose 60 exactly. is what you do with the other 40 Completely that matters. Completely true. So baseball is almost always played within that range of 400 to 600. It's just the way the game is played. Um, that being said, so do, do I think Houston's winning percentage will come down a little bit? Yes, I do. But do I think that right now they're the best team in the game, not just in record, but in the way that we watch them play on the field? 
I believe that as well. I think that their lineup is so deep. You look at the moves they made this past off season. Uh, this is a team that still the, the, the guts of it made the playoffs in 2015, and but for one bullpen meltdown uh, in in the uh, in the eighth inning of Game Four of the Division Series against Kansas City, that team is going to eliminate the the eventual champion Royals in four games. Uh, and that's how good that team was in 2015. They, they they wobbled a little bit early in 2016, but for the last four months of that season, they were really good. So really, uh, but for a, a rough start in, in, in 2016, they've been one of the best teams in the game since the start of the 2015 season. And so we're just seeing a, a continuation of that, plus, Clay, the additions of Beltran, McCann, and then Josh Reddick. So they, they have added veteran bats to what was already a really good lineup, Bregman has continued to evolve and, and develop. Correa, we know, one of the best players in the game. Springer, I love George Springer, everything he does. So their lineup, their position player group, I believe, is the best in the game. Now, pitching, we can ask a question of do they need one more starting pitcher? Maybe, but the good thing about it for them is that there is going to be a very good supply based on the number of teams that we've got that are, are likely sellers. Uh, you should see some starting pitchers moving at the deadline this year. So they are in a really good position. I, I think it's always a great story when you have a team that's never won the World Series uh, that has a chance to do so, much like the Preds in, uh, in, in the NHL playoffs right now. So I, I think that there are, it's a great story for the game. And again, I, I believe in the game of baseball, they are the oldest franchise to never win it, going back to their days as the Houston Colt 45s. We're talking to John Morosi. Final question for you. We're roughly 40 games thereabouts into the Major League Baseball season, a quarter of the way basically through the right. season so far. What would you say are the one or two biggest storylines? A lot of people, frankly, are not all in on baseball, right? I mean, they've been busy sure. watching the NBA. They've been busy watching the NHL as, as those seasons kind of come to a close. What do you stand out the most about a quarter of the way through the baseball season? What are the couple of biggest stories to you? I would say this, Clay. First of all, we're seeing, I believe, a revival of the American League East as, as what it used to be. I think we're seeing the Red Sox and Yankees, and I think there's a uh, there's always that great uh, talking about uh, bromides of baseball. Uh, you, you can never go wrong pointing out how – uh, how good they have been, and I, and I think that that division specifically, Clay, the American League East, I think is getting back to what it was ten years ago. Because the Yankees are back with Aaron Judge and that group, and we see the Red Sox with with Mookie Betts, who is still not that old of a player to begin with. He's not he's not a rookie like Aaron Judge, but he's a very very young player. So I, I think we're we're seeing the the reestablishment of that rivalry and the reestablishment of of those two teams. Um, the Yankees more so than the Red Sox as being World Series contenders. So I think what we've seen from Aaron Judge is a phenomenal story. I also love the fact that on the West Coast you've got the other flagship team in the Dodgers with Cody Bellinger, who is off to a phenomenal start in his career as well. So I would say it's the reestablishment there of, of the East being what it used to be. And then I think you look around the game, and you'd have to say this, the Cubs off to a bit of a slow start. That's a big storyline. Uh, we thought this team – and. They were widely predicted by many experts uh, entering the season. Oh, my gosh, how could anybody but the Cubs win the World Series? Look how strong they are. Well, I think they're pitching has regressed a bit. And uh, Theo Epstein is, pre is preaching calm right now, as he should. But uh, but this team, Clay, is not at all the team that it was last year from a record standpoint. Uh, they still have a lot of the same players. But there's just not quite that same vigor about them. I think they're just there's a, there's a step back where they're not quite as lively. Uh, I think part of that's they played a lot of baseball in the last two years. Their pitchers have expended a lot of pitches the last two years. So I think that the Cubs are, are not looking like their 2016 selves, which I think leaves the National League in a very wide open state. Outstanding stuff as always, John Morosi. Enjoy the game tonight between. The good old Anaheim Ducks and the Nashville Predators. I'll be there. Can't wait to watch myself. Like, can I wait? And again, uh, your your hometown, your city is, has been phenomenal. Great people, uh, and, and it just I love the passion. By the way, of the fans in this town for hockey. When we got in, when we walked into the restaurant. There was one TV on. It was on the other series, Pittsburgh Ottawa. So there, it is total hockey immersion, as you know, in your town. Nashville is uh, showing itself phenomenally well to the hockey world. 
Appreciate that, my man. We'll talk to him again next week. I am Clay Travis. You are listening to Outkick the Coverage here on Fox Sports Radio. Live from the Geico Fox Sports Radio studios, what does it mean when Geico says just 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance? It means you probably should have gone to geico.com 15 minutes ago. A lot of you reacted yesterday to our James Harden interview about the lawsuit that's been filed against him. Just so you know, cleaning this up. I reached out to Rusty Harden, who is the criminal defense attorney representing James Harden, gave him an opportunity to come on the show and respond to the allegations that have been made against James Harden. He did not want to do that. So we did try to give equal time. If you listened to yesterday's show, go back and listen to it. If you didn't hear it, blockbuster accusations against James Harden that he paid $20,000 to uh, an individual to beat up somebody based on a Facebook post that had been posted Uh, and that he watched that beating from inside of a strip club on his FaceTime. That is a wild allegation, and it could be substantial criminal liability in addition to civil liability for James Harden. Again, we had his attorney uh, reached out to him, offered him an opportunity to come on and respond, and he declined. Jason Martin, got to be quick, but give us the Tebow watch. Last three games, 0 for 10 at the plate, struck out five times, averaged down to 227, but that's bearing the lead. From the New York Post, Quote, they were warming up and throwing in front of us and I wasn't paying attention, said Doug Brussman, who brought his 13-year-old daughter to see her idol play. The dream location turned into a painful encounter when the former NFL QB overthrew a ball to a teammate, zoomed right underneath the railing, and found its landing pad on Brussman's nether regions. A guy screams, watch out, and as he's yelling, the ball comes right through the railing and hits me right in the nuts. It was a direct hit, unquote. This was Tuesday before the game. Tebow, no hits in his last three, but he did crush somebody in the LeVar balls. And that's your Tebow watch for this Thursday, May 18, 2017. Very well done there by Jason Martin. I'd encourage you guys, as always, to go back, download the podcast. Millions of you are going to do it in the month of May. Thank you to everybody out there who's been listening to the show. Thank you to the 250 AM and FM affiliates and also all of you on Sirius XM Channel 83. I'm sure there'll be some fireworks on Fox Sports Radio later today. I encourage you to turn into the her- tune into the herd. Hear from Christine Leahy. We talked a lot about the LeVar Ball incident. We talked about Baylor. And we talked about the fact that the NBA playoffs are basically over and we need to start the NBA Finals right damn now. Make it an 11-game series. In the Eastern and the Western Conference, there's no drama left there. Hopefully, I'm going to end up at the Preds game tonight. Big game. Not a lot of things on the American sporting calendar. Check out Preds Ducks if you want to be entertained tonight. Best event that's going on in the world of sports. I am Clay Travis. Thank you for the time. Up tomorrow on Fox Sports Radio.